Hi, everybody. I'm super glad to bring you all onto the next episode of Common Ground. And with me is my co-host, Dave Hamilton, founder of the America's Future Foundation, as well as John McGrory, who is the researcher for Newsmax. And thank you, John, so much for being here. My pleasure. It's uh, great to be here. Uh, we were just talking a little bit beforehand, and we had a good conversation going. But one of the points that John and I agree on is that it's impossible to really be an atheist because you look across the course of human history that every society is religious in a different way. And once you remove religion, you get some other substitute. And we're seeing this today where we kind of use science imperfectly organized as a religion. And what are your points about that, John? So I think first thing, when we go back and look at the Old Testament, and you look at the Ten Commandments, and whether you're Jewish, Catholic, or Protestant depends on how you break break up the commandments. But the first or the first and second commandments are very clear. I am God. You shall have no other God but me. Now, if, we want, if you read the Old Testament, you can see those commandments violated in big letters, whether they're they're building temples to Baal or Astarte or someone like that. And if you would ask the average Jew or the average Christian, they would say, you know, I've never broken the first or the second commandment. I've never, I've never burned incense to Thor. I've never sacrificed a cow to Zeus. But the reason it's first is it's probably the commandment we break more often than any other. Because when we push God out of the way, something else takes his place. That's why, you know, atheists may not believe in God, but I don't believe in atheists. <laughs> and whether you make it your money, power, pleasure, science, knowledge, ideology, whatever it is, it becomes God. And so uh, if people talk about the United States being a godless society. I'd say, no, we're not godless, we're idolatrous. And, and I mean, also realize for all of us here, if, if you are a believer, um, you don't get off that easy because one of the other idols I think we all have is we uh, is our own image of God. I always say that God speaks to me like a like someone from New York in his mid fifties. I go like, am I really? Is that really God, or am I just in an echo chamber? And, and bottom line is, we all are in an echo chamber, and yeah. our one of the goals of religion is to get rid of my false image of God and to come to the real God. But in the meantime, we all settle for the uh, the poor copy of it. And in the United States, as we've pushed God out, we've put all sorts of other small g gods in the way. So yeah. that's why I don't believe there's such thing as an atheist. It makes me chuckle because my conception of God is a Gen Z bro. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but I, the thing I love about the Old Testament is... In, for someone in my age category, I see it as a video game. You put the Jews in the hardest start position possible, and they have to survive against impossible <laughs> odds. And it's basically a story of their relationship with God as they are put in impossible situations, the Babylonians or Persians or Assyrians steamrolling them. And it's and what you find is the pattern you see again and again, where times are hard, the Jews go back to God. Times are easy. They replace it with other gods. Times are hard. They go back to God. You read the Old, Te you read the Old Testament. And you think to yourself, why don't they just stick with God? And you remember, you're talking at a 1,000 year time period. You're, and so you think of us over the last thousand years and you think that's pretty reasonable. But also I've kind of seen this trend today where we, we've seen a collapse in religion in the wealthy post-war period. And I'm kind of seeing a return to religion among um, that's happening today, although it you only see it in certain places. I think it's going to scale up as our society has more problems, and especially once we need to revitalize the birth rate. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, you say um, that if you read the Old Testament, I believe the Old Testament is actually, to me, one of the funniest pieces of literature. If, if you look at it seriously, seriously, you know, it's kind of a lather, rinse, repeat, you know, as you said. And how how bad is your short-term memory? I mean, if you go back to Exodus, the Red Sea parted. They walked through it. The waters the waters then flooded over Pharaoh and his army. And two minutes later, it's like, 
why'd you do this to us? Did, didn't yeah, well, did, so I'm guilty of that too, right? Um, uh, I, I like to chastise, if you will, the um, the disciples because they were there with Jesus, right? What whether you're a a Christian or not, right? Historically, you have all of these guys and, and a couple of women who were with Jesus, and they saw miracle after miracle after miracle, a burning bush type thing after burning bush, and then yet they stopped believing, mm -hmm. right? At, at some point, and and they saw that in their what in their one lifetime. Mm -hmm. From water to wine, walking, just, you know, calming the waters, whatever, raising Lazarus. And then two days later, it's like, oh, uh, I'm not sure he's the deal. Right. And we would all like to think if I were there, it would be a whole different story. And when you get a little humility, you realize I could be just as dense as they were. And I mean, that's the, that's the, the comfort of the Bible. In the end, you know, I, I can do something very stupid too. And yet God doesn't give up on me and Jesus doesn't give up on me. And there is forgiveness and there is a chance to start over again. Uh, but well, yeah. I, I like to think that I could be weak enough to betray him like Judas, mm -hmm. right? That, 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 that most of us would do that, but hopefully not stupid enough not, not to think he's the real deal. Well, I, I would I would like to think that too, but I always realize when I think that that's probably me at my most blind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my this, most is, yeah this, I, is a, this is something I call normie mindset, and I apologize, older guys, but normie mindset. You can put up signs of what and what normie means, and oh, sorry, and, um, and fringe. You can you can spell all these words out for us. I literally wrote a dictionary. We can still learn. I sent to you. Um, a normie is like a normal person and mm -hmm. I call normie mindset where you assume that your current frame of reference is the only thing and I pride myself on my ability to remember what happened before and it's crazy to think of just 2010 we were all alive then and um, like for example working the weekends didn't used to be normal the trans issue didn't used to be a thing uh, we didn't used to care about there are so many issues today that are front and center in our society, but 10 years ago, no one thought about. And then if you question people like, no, th that was never the case. And people get stuck in these mental loops of thinking that their current worldview is the only thing. And then if you show them, like imagine if we had the black death today, half the population dies. Enough, there would be a decent amount of people in the early phases of it who would just say, oh, yeah, this happened 10 years ago. Like, uh, oh, yeah, like, don't worry too much. This this sort of thing's normal. And it's just this very human trait of ignoring and belittling things that are just insane because people are stuck in kind of this very rigid worldview where everything around them has to be normal. Right. You know. I hate to quote the theologian Barbara Streisand, but in the song, The Way We Were, you know, what's too painful to remember, we simply choose to forget. Yeah. And look, I have a dentist appointment next Tuesday and I can partially, you know, I can think now how painful the last one was, but I'm certainly not, as I think about my last appointment, it's, it certainly is not bringing back the full pain that, that it was, you know, it, it gets softened with time, time yeah. heals all wounds. So, yeah. And, you know, you talk about that. Um, to me, I've always thought that one of the greatest stories in the Bible is the Good Samaritan. There's so much to that story. You know, people just say, oh, yeah, it's God, God forgives us. You know, God forgives us the way the father forgave the young son. That's that's just the tip of the iceberg here. So if you go back, so begin with this father has two sons, older son, younger son. Older son is the obedient son. Okay. Look at history. The oldest child is usually given the sense of responsibility. Oldest children go into the clergy, into the military, into the police uh, at a large, higher percentage than younger children because they parents had to get that one right and they instilled all of this in those older children so the older son does exactly what he's supposed to do and the younger one comes along and says i want my half of the inheritance because i wish you were dead and dad gives it to him now the interesting thing is this it says he goes off and lives a dissolute life 
Jesus does not describe the life. Jesus does not say what he did, but he doesn't need to because every one of us conjures up the image right away. We, we all got it. Right? And so the, the, old, the younger son loses the money. Things are terrible for him. He says, you know, even my, fa even my father's servants are better than I am. I'm going to go back. And what's interesting, he says, I will say this. Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I no longer am worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your servants. Now, you got to think he probably spent the whole trip home rehearsing the phrase. Now, like, you know, when you're going to see mom and dad, you start to think about it. Okay, me, father, I no, probably father, I am all this. Meanwhile, the, the older son has been doing what he's supposed to do. The father sees the son, runs out, grabs him, hugs him, brings him in, throws a party. The older son stands outside and says, I've done everything you've ever asked of me. And yet this son who went around with prostitutes and spent your money. Now, Jesus never said prostitutes. Jesus never said that word, but we all thought it, right? And the older son was thinking this. So what's happened is this. The younger son was out living that life. The older son was living it in his head and saying, boy, my brother's got it good. Boy, my brother's got it. Boy, I wish I could be like my brother. Well, he is, well, he is home being miserable. And the father says, come in. You know, it's only right. We don't know what happens after this. But if things were to go right, the younger son would explain to the older son it was awful. It might have seemed good at first, but it was really lousy. And maybe the older son might have learned, okay, you know, maybe I had it better than I thought. Or maybe the younger son, after a couple years or even a couple months, says, I'm tired of this. I want to go out and do it again. It wasn't as bad as I remember. Yeah. So we don't know what happens after that, but it's very likely, you know, that the younger son, after a few months, goes, it wasn't that bad. I think I'm going to go try it again. That's the story of addiction, you know, yep. of relapse. Um, it, so, even having childbirth, I, we like to joke that if women remembered what it was like the first time, they probably would never have another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Um, but so on the good side, you know that, uh, 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 that that's a good version of how lapse in memory can help us, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, we do forget the bad things we did and how they turned out and we repeat them. This is um, a critical tension Christianity gets right, where you have to have in your worldview, like the masculine type, which is discipline and the feminine side, which is warmth. And in Christianity, it's able to create a balance of, I just finished a video on Christianity, uh, and it'll kind of like come out in a couple of weeks. But um, one of the things I say is that Christianity is the warmest of the major world religions, where it's the one of the very few that, for example, abolished slavery or gave women the best treatment of any major religion ever. But it, it's able to do that because it has really strong standards. And so Christianity, because it has those standards, is able to be very warm. But at the same time, if you remove either of those, you end up with problems where if you remove the standards, you end up with the left, where people think the left's complete lack of standards is very kind and open but the reality is it's tyrannical because there's no stability and so the left ends up hating people who have standards because they feel judged by them and if you have the standards of the warmth you get islam which is this very restrictive society that has all these very um tough social norms that have kind of slowed down islam's development versus the west and so it's this very critical balance. So you know, I think there's look, a difference between a lot of Rudyard's um, followers, the guys that watch his stuff, and their understanding of the various world religions. And I think they have a very good understanding of the various principles, et cetera, and how they're different. But I think there's a whole bunch of people who think every religion is basically the same, and they don't think Christianity is significantly different than any other religion in the way that Rudyard's describing it, and which is, I, I jokingly call it Jesus the first socialist. Right, because he was the first guy saying, you know, let's take care of the poor and the less fortunate, et cetera, where everyone else said, if you are poor or you have a problem, God doesn't love you and you're a sinner and you deserved it, right? And might made right and all these sorts of things, right? So yes, this warmth of this caring kind of notion, Christianity is one, and it's also one of these ones with standards that are almost impossible to um, uh, fulfill on, but it has the get out of jail free card, which is grace, Right. right forgiveness, forgiveness and and repentance right. and that's different right mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah. Now, if you look at the Rembrandt picture of the prodigal son, and he has the the father has his hands around the son, one of the hands is very clearly masculine, and one of the hands is very clearly feminine. Hmm. To show that, and to me, when you talk about that, Rudyard, you, the when Jesus, you remember when Jesus uh, meets the woman caught in adultery, and they want to stone her. Yeah. Throw and you know, let he among you without sin cast the first stone. Now, it's interesting is it says the oldest ones drop their stones first. And the reason is because when you're older, like, yeah, I get it. Yeah, I, I, done that. I, grew up. I'm, I am much more aware of my failings now than I was when I was 18. You know, at 18, like, I know everything. And I'm, you know, now it's like, I know something and I kind of hope I'll do better. And then, but then when they all leave, Jesus says, he says two things, and you can't take either of them alone. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And you cannot take one of those two statements without the other. And that's what said, Rudyard, is, is the tension here. Neither do I condemn you is, is forgiveness. Go and sin no more is a challenge. And the church that just does neither do I condemn you never calls people to anything better than they are now. And a church that says, go and sin no more is unforgiving. So the two of them are in that tension. Yeah. So it's really bad for our society, I think, to not understand these basic principles and how Christianity is different than others. Mm -hmm. I am a, what I like to refer to as a backsliding Christian. I grew up agnostic. Like you, I've never believed in atheism. I've actually told atheists, I don't believe in you. You don't exist, right? And one would test it is to take a gun, put it to somebody's forehead and, a, and pretend to pull the trigger and they'll say, oh, God, you know, most of us mm -hmm. have a deep seated need to want to believe. And that's why there are trench, you know, conversions into trenches, et cetera, and all that kind of stuff. Right. So I grew up not wanting to believe in God, wanting to think I was OK, that I didn't need forgiveness. Right. That um, if God created me and you know, if I'm broken, it's his fault. Screw him. Mm -hmm. um, and that those, those are some fundamental differences. But a lot of people who are agnostic or call themselves atheists, I think, don't understand Christianity as it really is. They believe that it's a, a cult that has a bunch of mean-spirited, judgmental people who think they're better than everyone else. And the Christians I've met tend to think the exact opposite. Back to some of the points you've made, John, about, hey, the more I live, the more I know, and the less perfect I think I am etc that it's all about forgiveness that nobody is a is perfect etc but uh, i'd like you guys to address what you think agnostics and atheists actually think about christianity and why they think the things they think well first off i think it, you know the the ideas you say of christianity um with uh being compassionate does go back to judaism first off I mean, the beginning of Genesis says this, God created man in his image and likeness. And that says something very important to me. The person whom I dislike the most was made in the image and likeness of God. So who am I to dismiss this person? And that, that's Judaism. So Judaism, Judaism says this, and if you know, People who, some people, unfortunately, when they look at the Old Testament, they pick and choose that God is a jealous God, God is a vengeful God. You look at a lot of it, it's that this God is very tender. But what is interesting is this is a Judaism, Agda Nash, but he said, how odd of God to choose the Jews, okay? That this God appeared to Abraham and he says something revolutionary. He says, I'm the only God. For most of most societies, being polytheistic means if I go to battle against you and I win, so you put my God in your temple with your gods. It's it was never a question of your gods don't exist, but this odd group of people who said everything you do is fake. All of your worship is fake. That that's just a that's just a piece of stone. Isaiah joking, you know, when it falls over it. You need to you need to upright it. You know that's not a very that's not God. You have the great story of, of Elijah and all of the uh, all of the prophets who keep dancing around and slashing themselves. And he says maybe talk louder. Maybe his your gods are asleep. And Judaism says no. This is not the case. There's only one God. And Christianity comes from that. And it comes from the idea that 
human beings are made in the image and likeness of God. And so therefore nobody is beneath is beneath compassion, is beneath love. And Judaism, you did say, and it, it, Judaism struggled with the question of how do we how do we reconcile the idea that God blesses those who who follow him with children born deformed or children or dying at the age of one? I, you know, I was always like, well, their parents must have done something wrong. They, you know, something like that. And then the book of Job comes along. The book of Job is a man who's done everything right. He did everything he should. And he is tested. And he asks for answers. And the funny thing is, is when you get to the end of the book and God does speak to Job, he doesn't tell him why it happened. God just says, can you make the, the seas rise and fall? Can you make it rain? Can you cause the sun to rise and set? And Job says, I have spoken too much. I will speak no more. So Judaism begins, and any any worthwhile religion has to begin to grapple with the question of how do how do I explain an all loving God and what's going on? And nobody does it. And you can't, you can't answer it fully because in the end, sometimes the only thing you can do is be there with that person. And so I think athe when atheists look, they see Christianity and Judaism as judgmental because as you said, there are standards, but the funny thing is this, these standards don't exist because God wants them to. Those standards exist because, because God says, you're free to not do it, but in the end, you're really going to be miserable. That's a good point. And what I'd throw in is that everyone gets standards somehow. And the problem with the modern left is that they abdicate standards on things that traditional societies do, and they get it on silly stuff. If I dress up as Saladin for Halloween, I don't think that should ruin my life. But if I'm constantly cheating on my wife, I don't think that's, I think that's a decent thing to ruin my reputation. And it reminds me, you know, I read a book named A Secular Age by Charles Taylor. And it had a lot of interesting ideas, but it was one of the hardest reads I've ever done. And um, one of the points that the book made that's really interesting, because it talks about why Christianity went into decline over the last 500 years, is that Christianity became a middle class religion, and it pandered to that demographic. And so beforehand for the, like, I'd say like people who are, I don't want to turn this into a class thing, but I'd make it an intelligence thing. People who are lower intelligence and in pre-industrial Christianity, they had feast days, they had a much stronger sense of community, they had the cult of the saints. And then for the highest level of intelligence, you had a really advanced intellectual esoteric tradition where Isaac Newton was studying all of this complex Christian philosophy and all of the founders of modern science were Christians. And I deal with these like normie atheist questions of how come the world is made in seven days or how come there are other religions and that stuff. And if you look at that pre-industrial Christian philosophy, you can answer all of those questions immediately. And so there was this, a combination of this, um, like an easier religion for like, um, more common people. And then this really advanced philosophy for the highest level intelligence people and then what ended up happening was that um the lowest level of people just stopped practicing religion and they kind of just effed off and the highest level people were co-opted by business or science or politics and so when a lot of people see modern christianity they're basically seeing moral policing and i think that is the biggest turnoff for uh, people with the church today, that they feel like they're being policed without any, without getting a positive out of it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, interesting, if you follow the history of it, um, you know, the the Roman, em Roman emperors were all clean shaven until Marcus Aurelius saw himself as a philosopher and Greeks wore beards. And so he wore a beard. So when he wore a beard, suddenly all the men in Rome started to wear beards. And there's a great, there's a Latin phrase that says the, the beard does not make the philosopher. So you all wore the beard. Why? Because they wanted to be like the Roman emperor. A lot of guys in Brooklyn do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh yeah. Tell me about it. So, but what happened? So if you were a Christian in Nero's time, it caught, it would cost you, you know, you, you could be, you could be tied up and become the, a, a living torch for one of his parties. They light you on fire as a torch for the party. So it, 
it was it was serious stuff to say I'm a Christian. And Constantine comes along and he becomes a Christian and he makes Christianity the religion of the empire. And now all of a sudden it's fashionable to be Christian. And some so this is once again one of those tensions where is Christianity better if it's small but serious? Or should it be should it be big tent pulling in as many people as possible? And this is as a Catholic, you're looking at Benedict versus Francis. Benedict said, I, we need, we're going to hold to these standards. If people walk away while well, we're sad for them, the church we'll have will be more fervent. And hopefully that fervent example will help, uh, will help attract people. Francis says, we're, we're the big tent here. Everyone come in. And, you know, the long lines of Flannery O'Connor said the the church is, well, here comes everybody. And there's a tension there, once again, like we talked about the other tension. There's a tension there between the two of them. And Christianity became the, the thing to do. Nowadays, it's not, as you said, you know, people don't see it, don't see a need for it. And one of the reasons they don't see a need for it, as you said, look, none of us here on this, none of the three of us is asking ourselves, do I have food for tonight's dinner? We, we all have a refrigerator full of stuff. Nobody here is asking themselves the question, um, will I make it to tomorrow? Now, one day the answer is going to be no, but we don't think that way. And we also don't think the way of, and if I don't make it to tomorrow, am I going to be spending all eternity in hell? And we, we don't think of that. You know, I had this experience when I was younger. My family, we went on a, on a cruise. And the cruise was the the cruise was just behind a hurricane. Hurricane had never hit land, but it was at sea. We were in no danger. There was no danger at all. We we're far enough away, but it made the ship rock all day long. So for the first three days of the cruise, this was what you had all day. They had air. They had seasickness bags. You couldn't go five feet without a seasickness bag there. If you've ever been on a cruise, you know that the chapel is about the size of a phone booth because why spend space on a chapel when you can spend it on a, another bar or another Casino. slot machine somewhere? Yeah. They had to move the mass that Sunday up to the main auditorium because 3,000 people went to mass on that cruise because they thought that this was their last day on earth. And of course, once, you know, once this stops, well, okay, you know, I don't. I don't need to worry about it anymore. And th that's our lives. And th that was the Israelites. Um, that's Christianity. We we come to God. Unfortunately, when we're in need. After nine eleven, all of a sudden, everybody started going back to church. And after during the pandemic, we all want to go to church, but we were told you can't, which was kind of uh, oh, ironically sad. And you know, as I, we talk about the pandemic, as I said to you earlier. Anything can become a science, uh, can become a religion. And if you look at the pseudo-religious um, response to COVID, and as I say this first, I've realized what I'm saying is not, uh, is not insulting organized religion, but it's about what science did. So, so we had Pope Fauci who made his, uh, who made his statements although sometimes those statements were contradictory. Um, we had the whole clergy who were, making, who were making the statements and telling us what to do. We would watch as the prophet Andrew Cuomo would get on every day and discuss, uh, and discuss things. We had, the, we had the religious garb. If you read, Jesus goes after the Pharisees, says you widen your phylacteries. A phylactery was a was a little uh, pouch on your arm that had biblical verses in it. And he said that the Pharisees would make theirs larger to show they were holier. Well, it's not enough now for me to wear one mask. I'm going to wear two masks. Maybe I'll wear three masks. Maybe I'll wear the big plastic thing and I'll wear it in my car by myself. No, I'm, this is the way I show that I'm, this is my religious garb and I get to wear my, I've gotten vaccinated, uh, button or sticker or whatever to show that I'm a true believer. 
and we had the sacraments of, of the rituals of standing six feet apart from each other. And we had the heretics, the heretics who said, I don't buy into all of this. And the heretics, just like the heretics of old, needed to be shunned and ostracized. So when you throw out religion, something else is going to come in and take its place. And we we saw this happen. And what's interesting is when we saw it happen, we saw it happen as churches were closed. You know, churches were declared non-essential. But bars were. And and that that bothered me, you know, that 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 this is non-essential. And also real we we had what was interesting, just like the angel of death in Exodus, we had a disease that knew who the bad people were. So if you went to a BLM protest, the angel of death, just like if you put the blood on your lintels, passed over you. But if you went to a wedding or a church service or a Trump rally or a NASCAR race, the angel of death realized that you were evil and smote you. I have a, a funny story. Real quick, I mean, I, I love both. You guys have made this point before many times, and you're both doing a very good job of it. Rudyard has videos on this, et cetera, about um, how uh, atheism, well, how science has become a religion and all the trappings of COVID, et cetera. I mean, I think we all understand the fundamental desire. It was natural for us to be very, very afraid people were dying and that uh, we, and compliance with practices that would work, just like not eating shellfish, probably a good idea or not eating pork to get trichinosis, right? Okay. All of those things would have made sense. Where it went off the rails for me was when people started, A, pronouncing themselves as science itself and that they were the only authority. And if you quibbled with that, if you dared to ask a question, if you said, what about acquired immunity? If you asked about um, uh, treatments, if uh, you questioned the not not the value of vaccines, but the total efficacy of that. You know, when being, being told they were one hundred percent or ninety five percent or better. When you if you question anything, you became an apostate. That's where it seemed to become a religion, mm -hmm. a hardcore religion, with, mm -hmm. uh, uh, with almost like the Spanish Inquisition. Mm -hmm. And there was a arms race to virtue signal and be more compliant and more strict, etc. And when you saw somebody get a thousand dollar fine for sitting in the uh, uh, their pickup, watching a sunset at a state park with their wife alone because they weren't wearing a mask. You thought, my God, you guys have lost your minds. And this is a crazy ass religion. This isn't just a religion, mm -hmm. right? This is a hyper-zealous hyper religion. Um, most religions are suffering, right? I would say maybe with the exception of Islam, I don't know, but it seems- Islam's going to be less religious, right? TikTok ironically killed us. TikTok has done a massive amount to kill Islam lately. That's a whole different story though. Mm -hmm. Okay, but but the but the religion of uh, belonging to a church that believes like me, as part of the cool kids club, the cool kids club church seems to be alive and thriving, and and that one is all about identity politics. It's all about uh, adherence to COVID. It's all about controlling speech. It's all about whether or not you are racist, sexist, homophobic, is whatever. That church has grown. Mm -hmm. so. It has. And it's grown because one of the things that they that they realize, and I like the phrase "cool kids club" here, because in the end, ridicule is far more effective than violence in shaking people's faith. It's you know, actually Rule Thirteen of of Alinsky's Rules for Radical. Right. You know, violence creates martyrs, and martyrs create followers. Vi Absolutely. Ridi a, ridicule. A, 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 Ridicule creates um, um, people with feet of clay. This uh, leads me back to a story I have where um, I um, have a long-standing beef with a communist YouTuber. And he he's made like five, it's most, mostly a one-sided beef where he's made like five videos um, going after me. And one of them is I made a video criticizing science. And what my top criticism of science is it's incredibly easy to have science be a mirror for what you want to see. Because the way that works is you create studies that you study the things you want to see and you skew the data and then you have no other frame of reference or values or standards to hold yourself to. An example of that is gender relations where you cannot make a scientific argument from real biological data that men and women are the same. Like any test you'll see, men and women are different on most things you'd look at. 
But what we did was we made a kind of weird argument that the work, you guys know the Frankfurt School argument, reality is whatever we want it to be, thus men and women don't exist, or there's no real difference. And that became the scientific position. And so if you question that, you're against the science. But the reality is that was, uh, that's not science, that's just making crap up. And um, well, I think your fundamental principle is really important, which is the notion of a hypothesis. No one does a study or, or does an experiment or whatever without a hypothesis, right? They yeah. had a starting position, which is your point. And they're hoping to prove their hypothesis is correct. Very few people do random shit to see how it turns out. The great irony was right. that the YouTuber who was criticizing me, his criticism was Rudyard doesn't like science. He is like some Amish person. But the, the, the thing I found so deeply ironic, and this is something that always trips me at the left, the left will do exactly what I say they're going to do in the video without any degree of self-awareness. Something I've said in about 10 videos is people on the left will say I'm a bigot and then provide no other argument for whether or not what I'm saying is true. Someone on the left watches that video, does that. And for this YouTuber, I said um, people will wear the garb of science without actually doing the scientific method. And no one believes in the scientific method more than I do. I just think science cannot be used as a religion because science is, it's like um, uh, a plow and the plow is good for farming, but if you want to eat a plow, <laughs> you're out of luck. And so-, um, so, I so I, I, In defense of you, I want to say that you, you made this point pretty well, but I think it bears amplification. You are not anti-science and you believe in science. You want good science. You want good to, science, to right. practice what they preach scientifically. And that's also true of religion. There are very few bad religions, all right? If you look at any religion, there are people who practice them badly. And I grew up hating Christianity and Christians because the ones I hung around with were pieces of crap. Mm -hmm. And they all told me I was going to hell. I remember as a young boy, I and some of my good Christian friends robbed the liquor store. And the next, and that Sunday, the next morning, we're all sitting there in church, bright eyed, bushy tails, acting like this. And I go, last night, didn't we just rob a liquor store? <laughs> what the hell's going on here, guys? And you're, you're all sanctimonious and shit? No, I mean, I grew up, the hypocrisy that drove me crazy. And this is what drives you crazy, Roger. You want people, if they're going to believe, say they're scientific, to behave that way. If you want to say, and, and it's not saying that religion is bad. It's bad. There are bad Christians. There are bad, whatever. They just bastardize it. I grew up thinking that I can't be a Christian because the people that I that demonstrated to me did a very, very poor job. And I've decided later in life, I go, just because they're bad at it doesn't mean it's not good itself. You know, when you talk about science, if you talk to true, true scientists, they're very humble. Because in the end, they make mistakes. A great story. Einstein was doing one, one calculation and it didn't come out right. So he solved it by adding a constant to it. You know, it's like you're doing your taxes and it comes up a hundred dollars short. So you do is I had a hundred dollars somewhere, you know, and it all balances out. And later on, a further discovery showed why they didn't balance out. And he called that constant that he added the greatest mistake of my life because he, you know, because he was so set you know, on like he cheated, right? right? He cheated. I mean, and I mean, you go through and that happens a lot, and especially. I understand. Can you imagine spending 10 years of your life and getting millions of dollars in grants to try and prove something? And then in the end, it's not right. That's Paul Ehrlich's yeah. career. Yeah. Yeah. Paul. Ehrlich, yeah. Oh, uh, do, do you know the story of cold fusion? That was a, that was a, okay. Uh, do you know that one, Dave, these mm -hmm. two professors in Utah thought that they had learned how you could create energy right on, right on your dining room table. And the problem was that it steamrolled, it snowballed so quickly that when they realized their mistake, like they just had to keep digging deeper and deeper because they couldn't really admit the fact that the experiment was wrong until people started looking and said, if what you said happened, the two of you would be dead of radiation poisoning right there in, in, your, in your kitchen. And, but by the time it was exposed and the two of them, their careers were ruined over this, but they just invested themselves so much into it. They wanted it too badly. They, we want what we want, when we want it, how we want it, no matter what. And that's, and so I, 
But with with the COVID thing, I I would have been fine with the idea of Fauci and saying we're we're going through a time of darkness here. We're trying our best. What we say today may not be what we're going to say tomorrow as we get more information and we revise things. That's humility. That's humility, and and that's livable. But instead, to hear. I told you that you didn't need masks because I didn't want you to take them when the when the uh, medical when other people need them. Right. That's that's not that's not grasping your way in the dark. That's a lie. The no, it's the that noble was, lie, but the noble lies are never really noble. That, this that is, was rewriting history. Right. This is one of Christianity's biggest advantages is if you look over history, most cultures are face driven, where the idea of face, it's really big in Asian cultures where, for example, the Chinese Communist Party, if they make a mistake, their society does not allow them to admit they made a mistake if they do all these hoops to get around that. And Christianity removed the idea of face. And I think, all right, that was an incredibly good decision. Because once you remove face, you can look at the truth and humility isn't most cultures, humility is you are offending the honor of your tribe by showing that you made a mistake. And that doesn't exist in our society. No, it, it is a hallmark of Christianity to okay. say that you are broken, you are a sinner, you are imperfect. And not necessarily that sin is this evil notion of sin, but it's the archer version of missing the target, right? That we're all not quite perfect. And that's okay. okay. That's not okay, as you say, in all these face driven societies. Just think of the gospel, Peter denies Jesus. By the time the gospels are written, Peter is clearly the leader of the church. He could have said, you're not putting that in there. Mm -mm. Okay? He, could have, he could have quashed that. And the people writing the gospels could have said, we can't put that in there. You know, we, we can't make our revered, our the revered head of the church mm -hmm. look so miserable. And that was I mean, that was humility, right? That was humility, and I mean, and Peter, uh, Peter, he sees Jesus risen, you know, and and Jesus says, you know, feed my sheep. And then the story goes, he goes to Rome, and at one point, when the persecution became worse in Rome, he tries to flee Rome, and he sees Jesus walking back to Rome, and he says, "Quo vadis, Domine? Where are you going, my Lord?" And Jesus says, "I'm going back to Rome to die." And Peter realizes I got to go back there. So even the the head of the church who had seen the risen Jesus still tried to escape. Oh, Je Jesus rises and he appears to the apostles. And what do they do? They go back and hide again. And then Jesus and Jesus ascends to heaven. What do the apostles do? They go back and hide again. It's, uh, I mean. You and I should certainly, we should all certainly feel very comforted in the idea that the people, Jesus chose extremely fallible people. He chose St. Paul as his mes messenger. Mm -hmm. Who was clearly a OCD bully, um, uh, mean, mm -hmm. a hateful person up until that point. And, and, and it's go back and it's, this is an extension of Judaism too, but, you know, Jesus chooses, uh, God chooses Moses, who can't speak. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah, we don't show him that way in the movies, right? They don't talk about Aaron. Right. Um, God chooses the, the great story of Gideon, the judge. Do you know that one? Where he had all of these, he had all of the, this whole army ready to go. And God says to Gideon, says, tell them all, anyone who's afraid or anyone who has something else to do, leave. And most of them leave. And it's like, really, God? And then he says they go down to they go down to a, a stream to drink water. And God says those who those who use their hands like this to drink the water, get rid of them. And only those who lean over and lap up the water like dogs are the ones you're to choose for this mission. I, I'm I'm sorry, God. You, you're like, everything you've done. One percent of my my troops will be with it you. It was, and they won. Because it wasn't about Gideon, it wasn't about the people, it's about God. So, you know, we talk about this Christianity, I do for your listeners, I talk, Judaism, if you read the Old Testament, it's very clear that the God, that the God of the New Testament is clearly 
the same God of the Old Testament. Unfortunately, some people look and they find a couple statements in the Old Testament, like, oh, God is a jealous God, and, you know, and he smites people. But there's a lot more in there that's all that's very comforting too. Uh, I think, unfortunately, is that people people just look at it as being judgmental and they throw the whole thing out. So, um, you know, I um, was introduced to Islam a long time ago when I was boxing, and uh, I cons- I thought about uh, I read the Quran and I thought about um, pretty hard about converting, etc. An I have a number of uh, Muslim friends, and their view is, you know, they believe in the Bible, they believe in the New Testament. But they would say that, you know, many parts you guys got wrong. And the way they interpret these things is and one central one is that Jesus did not die, that they got someone else to take the fall for him and someone else was crucified in his place. Uh, that gets back to Rudyard's point about sort of things. Our, our leader can't die. Our leader can't be humiliated, excoriated, go through the passion, et cetera. That, 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 that view, that cultural view is such that no, 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 that, that couldn't happen. So we had to get a fall guy to do it, right? Um, and there are certain things that make Christianity, and you, you look at all the religions, and I, I, I encourage people to look at every single religion, understand their basic tenets, et cetera. But if you look at uh, Christianity, in my opinion, it is fundamentally different from a lot of, uh, from all the other religions based on the humility aspect alone. Mm-hmm. And also it's probably the hardest. I mean, it's the hardest to believe in in, in, in many ways, right? It's a lot more fun to believe that there's an ocean god, you know, and, and Poseidon, et cetera, and he'll take care of you when you go on a trip mm-hmm. across the ocean, right? It's and- all, it's also the hardest because it's a both and. You know, if you if you give me this set of if you give me this clear set of rules here, I can deal with that, okay? But now you tell me, uh, as a Catholic, you know, it's faith and good works, so I have to believe and I have to do good, so I can't just rely on my faith. And I can't ju- and I can't earn my way into him. Well, where's the balance? Good luck. God is God is perfect justice, and God is perfect mercy. Yeah, we want I, mercy. Uh, we want grace. We do not want justice. Right? How do I how do I grasp those two concepts in my head? You spend your life trying to figure it out, and that's I mean that's part of the depth of religion. Is I need to go. I need to understand this deeper. You know, you. Know, uh, Dave, you've been married for a number of years, right? 30-something. 30-something. Your spouse probably surprises you every so often, right? Every day. Every day, right? You know, oh, yes, she'll she'll have a hamburger because she always has a hamburger. I think I'd like, I think I'd like a chicken sandwich, hey? Well, wait a second. Because this, because the human, the person has a depth to them that we don't, we don't fully grasp. And that's what friendship is. That's what love is. Learning to learning the depths of another person, and the same is true with God. You know, as Saint Paul says, "Who has known the mind of God?" It's um, you know, we will spend our lives getting hopefully closer and closer, um, and then we will hopefully spend eternity contemplating this. But it it we don't get it because in the end, if we did get it, then it's boring. Now, if you and your spouse knew each other perfectly, in the next year you're, you're done, right? Yeah. It's it's about another. It's about the mystery of the person. And as you said, Christianity, Christianity, locked in on this, coming from its its Judaic, its Judaic roots of people are in the image and likeness of God, which gives them a depth, which gives them, which gives them something greater than a dog you can love your dog but dog does not have that does not have that human soul and you know, when you talk about christianity i think one of the important things when we look at it is as saint paul says in the fullness of time jesus came if jesus had come 200 years earlier during the the hashmonian dynasty um you know, after the Maccabees, it would have remained a religion that would have been very localized. If he'd come 200 years earlier, you know, the Assyrians or the Babylonians, Christianity would have remained nothing more than a localized religion. But Jesus came at a time of the Roman Empire, which had 
a, a Greek and Roman philosophy, which did understand the idea of the person better than anything that went before it. And St. Paul was able to go through the empire and spread this message at a, t at a time that it it could have been spread. hundred years earlier, it wouldn't have happened. I'm, so curious. That, I'm curious, John, are you a fan of Paul Johnson? I, I've i read some stuff. Uh, I really don't know enough to uh, to give a, a good opinion on it. I've I just a couple of the arguments you made. I'm reading his history of the Jews right now, and there's stuff I heard from that. But a point I want to throw in here is that in the last video I finished is that people don't realize that science is philosophically dependent upon Christianity because the reason the Greeks, the Greeks and the Romans were incredibly smart and they had pretty incredibly good logical systems. But the reasons it never got modern science with the Industrial Revolution or the discovery of the New World or any of that is because it lacked humility, because the Greeks and the Romans thought, if I made an intellectual argument for something, that argument is better than external evidence. And the reason China or India or whatever never made that breakthrough is that Christianity made a combination of humility, which naturally leads to empiricism and testing the thing. It also combined it with a rational universe that as we discover the world, we realize that it's God's creation. And right. on top of that, it threw in um, the idea of, um, damn, I made a 20 minute segment about that, I'm forgetting. But the thing is, science is built upon assumptions in Christianity. And if you look at the founders of science, it was all months in the 1300s mm -hmm. and they invented the scientific method, but also even today, you can correlate scientific output with recent Christianity, where, for example, your society can get at two generations being agnostic and then your scientific output collapses. That happened in Europe after the World Wars, where Europe's scientific output collapsed precipitously after World War II, two generations after they became agnostic. The same thing happened in the Soviet Union as well, where two generations oh. after secularization, science went into collapse. And now the United States, oh, the third thing is belief in abstract truth. And the United States um, is the technological powerhouse because we have the last, the latest history of a big Christian society. But also what we're seeing now is the collapse in the belief of truth, which is going to hurt science if it continues, because people really shit on the church for going after Galileo. But if you want to research gender, race, genetics, our society is going to be as, if not more cruel than the Catholic church mm -hmm. was to people like Galileo. We're questioning anything. Yeah. Right. You know, to, if I, if I could, if I were made language czar for one day, one of the first things I would get rid of is phrases like "my truth," "your yeah. truth," "his truth," because if my truth and your truth are different, then one of them is not truth. Yeah. Your story can be different from my story. Your belief system. Both, both have to be true. Both are either true or false. As you say, Rudyard, um, one of the reasons that so one that basic ideas behind science is that there is there are rules saint thomas aquinas uh, the one of the brilliances of what aquinas wrote is that the world was made according to god's order and we being made in the image and likeness of god are capable of discerning god's order now we can't discern all of it and interesting in terms of in terms of uh, hubris, in terms of, you know, uh, do you know what Harvard's original motto was veritas pro Christo in Ecclesia, the tr truth for Christ in the church and the three books, one of the books was upside down on the idea that we, we can strive to, but we cannot know everything because only God knows everything. So they threw out Christ, the church, and they flipped the other book right side up. And, and you know, part of, Part of the the only reason that science works is that if I drop if I drop my phone here, it falls to the ground. The day it ceases to fall to the ground, we need to go back and rethink science. And we need to go back and rethink this building I'm sitting in. And we need to rethink the bridges that that span. Now, maybe it's just that I happen to be in a moment in in a magnetic area here where it where this happens, but the day that that phone doesn't fall to the ground is a day that science needs to rethink itself. And it's called a paradigm shift. And we've seen it sometimes. Einstein, 
uh, quantum physics was a paradigm shift of what we saw before, things like that. But it, but the whole idea is that every time I do this, it's going to turn out the same. And if it's not, then science doesn't work anymore. So the big paradigm shift that we're experiencing now are a couple of things. One is um, this notion of objective truth, right? My truth versus the truth, this kind of stuff. That, that, that's been a big paradigm shift. Um, not being judgmental not having rules, et cetera, um, and that's going to paradigm shift, et cetera, that my identity uh, is more important than what I accomplish or do, right? Who I am as a person uh, is seems to be central to, to, to people's lives, which it didn't used to be, right? People were not self-focused. They had to focus on their community, others, et cetera, or whatever. So there are a whole bunch of paradigm shifts that we're experiencing now that, um, and that are the tenets of this new church. We've talked about, you know, you, you're not going to not be religious. You're going to be religious. You're just going to care about worship and, and focus on certain things. We focus on hedonism a, a great deal in this new church, right? We focus on um, our identity a great deal. Um, we've decided that there is no, funda- there are no fundamental truths. There are my view, my opinion, et cetera, right? Which ironically is a statement of truth, which is a statement. Of, there are no, there are no truths or there are no rules as a rule. Okay. I figured out that logical problem like five years ago, and I'm shocked no one else reached it. And sorry to cut you off, Dave, but the point that really gets to me is that there's no, I have this debate with most people in our society, that most people don't believe in idea of reality. And there's a couple of variants. There's the leftist version. There's a technologist version saying that we can invent some AI that will bring the rapture. And I just can't believe most people don't believe in reality because if I punch you in the face, you are punched in the face. It doesn't matter what you think. And I just can't so, believe so, people so Pluto, it. that goes back to Pluto had a, an argument where he proved the chair wasn't there. And then he proved that the chair was there. But the only really way to prove the chair is there now is to pick one up and hit him. With <laughs> yeah. Right. And which is your point. You may be you came to the same conclusion, which is I punch you in the face. So, uh, OK, so there is something in reality and you can talk yourselves just like we did in Jonathan Swift's Modest Proposal, where you can go down this bunny trail of if this, then that, and you end up in some sort of bizarre world where we're eating babies, raising babies as food, right? And that's that's the point of the uh, of Jonathan Swift's uh, Modest Proposal. That's not good science. There are objective truths, et cetera. We try to talk ourselves out of them. Um, and, and, and in every aspect of our life, now, without getting too political on it, there was a study recently done on abortions. There were 250 uh, terminations, and out of those 250 plus terminations, um, something along the lines of uh, 40% or so were uh, uh, st- uh, still alive, were born still alive. And the mean uh, life of, the, of those, of those uh, aborted children was 32 minutes, and some lived as long as four hours. And what's interesting about that study is that some people's reaction to it is, well, if that baby gets outside the womb, right, um, then it, uh, because its mother intended for it to die, it's okay to not render aid. And it's okay to actually actively try to kill that child, even though it has made it outside the womb and it is breathing, right? If you walk into a hospital and you, uh, your water broke and you had a baby, right? Right then and there. That hospital has a legal, moral responsibility to help you take care of that child and to save its life, the life of the mother and the child, right? Mm-hmm. Here's an example of people choosing an outcome, a logic system or whatever, right? Based on how they want it to turn out. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I want it to be okay to get rid of this baby at the last final moment. I mean, long after uh the first trimester long after the second third whatever i could have used the uh you know morning after pill whatever no but i i'm gonna have i i want abortion to be legal and so therefore i want it to be legal even after the baby has made it out of the womb mm-hmm. that is almost a religious zealotry for it there's no middle ground on that point right well like that's the, when we talk about, about the yeah we talk about the no no reality the problem is this this thing growing inside this woman is it a human being or isn't it 
if it but is my not, is the inconsistency of it. Sometimes it is. If right. I'm, if I'm pregnant and I'm in a car wreck and someone kills me and my baby, in certain sense, that person gets tried for two murders. Right. Right. But the problem is this is that, and I've said this to pro-lifers to uh, both sides. If that is not a human being, then no amount of your wishing, no amount of your screaming will endow humanity on it. On the other hand, if that is a human being, no amount of your wishing, no amount of your talking can deny the humanity of the embryo that is growing inside. So the que the first question, I think the primary question, is it a human being? Uh, the phrase is, your ought should follow your is. Is it a human being? Then what ought I to do? If it's not a human being, feel free to abort it. But if it is a human being, then there are certain requirements here. and. So and what's important to me about this conversation we're having is people on the outside will say they had a conversation about abortion and they'll minutes. say they had it up the pros or cons to good or bad of abortion. I'm not doing that. And so many people will have a problem with this. I, my understanding is following the conversation. They will get triggered on the word abortion. And that is the last thing their neurons will be able to fire on. As opposed to, do you not see the inconsistency of your logic and or belief systems about this when it's become situational. Right. Michael, the abortion question to me is, let's take that three steps down the road. My first question is, what is this? What is this? How do you evaluate a moral system? Then we'll get to that. But 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 let's talk, let's talk about the moral system and the and what this thing is in the first place. And then we can talk about it because it's interesting that the same people who would say, you know, that, that they would leave it up to choice would also grant far greater, um, far greater um, agency, if you will, to a dog. Yeah. You, can't get, <laughs> you go to jail for that. And, and look, and as I said, if in the end, the science shows that this is not a human being, fine. But the science has not shown that. And also in terms of religion, one of the interesting things is this. They always get the idea that this is something new. But if you're a Christian, the first teaching document of the church beyond the, the writings of Paul and the Gospel of the New Testament is called the Didache. And the Didache says in it, why are we different from everybody, from, from non-Christians? We do not abort our children. It's right. I mean, is one is one of the earliest, the earliest teaching document of the church said that. So it's pretty well rooted since the beginning. So I follow that. Your point about the dog is interesting, right? If I were to kill a dog randomly because I chose to kill my dog, I own that dog. I choose that. Dog, but the SBCA and the local authorities are going to come after me for animal cruelty because I killed that dog. Yeah, do you have that dog to do that? About to 10 puppies, right? Right. And I mm -hmm. killed them, or I killed the puppies after they were born, right? I would be in trouble, mm -hmm. right? Similarly, if I'm a woman or a man, a family, and I want to keep that child and you kill that child, you do something to that child, you are in trouble. However, if I want it dead, because I want it dead, that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's the inconsistency of saying, is this a child? Is this not a child? To your point. And it's it, it's situational. If you are born of a mother who wants you dead, you are dead. Yep. If you are you born know. of a mother who wants that you are alive, you're okay. And, and I'm talking after birth. Right. Well, you know, it's interesting because you can follow the track of this the same way you can follow the track of affirmative action is that as the facts came in, the arguments changed. So if you go back to the 1970s, right after you know, after Roe v. Wade, which even people who are pro-abortion say was a very poorly decided uh, case, I mean, it, it's it, it's it's hardly written in terms of in terms of logical leaps. But, and the main point of this entire thing has been who has jurisdiction, and is right. it the states or is it the government? That's what came out of this most recent SCOTUS right. rule, right? Right. But it's interesting because when it began, one of the questions was, well, we don't know if it's a human being or not. So therefore, it's not deserving of protection. Someone I knew said, you know what, if you're not sure, wouldn't we tend to fall on the on the side of caution? But 
the the early arguments were all that we're not sure if it's a human being. And then all of a sudden we were able to do sonograms. We we're able to do incredible surgery uh, in utero and all this. And, and I grew up believing that. I want you to know I was one of those people. Mm -hmm. And I advocated that point very forcefully to the point where I made the leading pro-life um, debater in the state break down and cry and leave the stage. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I was one of those. To your yeah. point, because of more science, et cetera, more knowledge, et cetera, then, then opinions and belief, uh, understanding can change. Right. So we're no longer discussing whether or not it's a human being. It all keeps falling back to choice. Because... The, the science can no longer justify that this is just an undifferentiated clump of cells. So what happens? So we need to change the argument. John Haidt's research has shown that about 90% of the population feels an emotion, and then they develop a rationalization for it afterwards. Mm -hmm. About 10% um, think it through rationally, and they add emotion at the end. And um, and, and, th and that is the core of this discussion for me. We have to be using abortion. We could use other topics, right, mm -hmm. as the playing field for this tendency to be irrational, emotional beings who then justify with logic as best they can, sometimes very poorly, mm -hmm. most, most usually very poorly. Uh, right? part, part of the problem is this, Roger, the phrase I've heard used is hypostasized emotion. I feel it so I'm much, it must be true. <laughs> and the problem, first problem is this, is feelings come and go. You know, yeah. I wake up this morning sad, and then I have breakfast and I'm happy. Well, the feeling is the feeling is legitimate. I Did you feel that way? Yeah, I felt that way. Does that mean you get to act on it? No. I, mean, also, I can acknowledge the emotion and still say, but but I can't act on it. There are certain, there used to be something called the reasonable person, the reasonable man rule, right? Yeah. So there is a Spanish soccer coach that kissed a woman in celebration after they won a cup. Mm -hmm. And he kissed her full in the mouth. And because she felt that this was an assault, he is being tried for sexual assault and being prosecuted for that. Whereas if a man kissed me in France straight on the mouth, I would go, oh, he's French. Right. And, 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 but, but because, and there's this rule of law, which is you take your victims as you find them. So let me give you an example. Let's say you have a hemophiliac in a car, right? You run into him and you were drunk, right? So you're guilty of a DUI. And in that case, you killed this susceptible person because he was a hemophiliac, right? Another person could do the exact same act, right? Run into a car. And a healthy a football player, et cetera, who bounces off and hops up and walks away, right? Weren't they both guilty of the exact same um, offense? One was a DUI or driving or whatever. Well, I think there, there are certain things that are meant to be uh, masters and other things that are meant to be emissaries. And for emotion, one of the theories of history I invented is that I think humans are 90% emotion and 10% logic. And you look over the course of history, I look at, try to figure out what emotions drive certain societies and you need your emotions and you should listen to them. But also emotions are one of the things where if you put them in the driver's seat, they just get bigger and bigger and bigger. And there's a certain point where I think everyone has to go through a point of their life where this is really horrible. I don't want to do this, but I'm still going to do it anyway. But if you let your emotions dominate your life, they'll just grow and grow and grow until they become demons that like completely control you. And this is what we're looking at right now, where we picked a demon in our society, and that was validation. But the thing is, if you feed that demon, it's just going to grow bigger and bigger and bigger until it consumes your entire society. And that's what we're seeing with the bizarre, illogic, and craziness that's going on right now. Mm -hmm. Be feelings, you said your feelings come and feelings go. And you have no control over how you feel. You only have control over how you react to how you feel. I mean, road rage. Yeah. Road rage is about, I, I allow the feeling to really take charge of me. You know, things that are happening in airplanes now. Now, I must admit, I think that the, uh, you know, what the airlines are doing, you know, 
I can help. I can totally see why they're doing it, but it still is a question of I'm I'm allowing my emotions to get the better of me. And you need and the other thing is this is you, you need to you need to acknowledge the emotion. If I don't acknowledge I feel that way, then it's just gonna go underground, it's gonna find another way to come out. I acknowledge yeah. but I don't act on it. Hmm. That's so, a good but this gets back to uh, this overarching discussion was around religion about belief systems, values, et cetera, how uh, while we are no longer classically religious you know, as much as you know, Christianity and other religions, um, there we are still religious. It, it's never going to go away. And we are going to replace those formal religions with our own new set of values, religions, doctrine, et cetera. And a lot of those today seem to have to do with a, a much more illogical set of system that doesn't believe in objective truth, cares mostly about my feelings, tells me you can't judge me. I want what I want the way I want it. And that is detrimental to our society and our long-term the prospects for our civilization. Right. No, I think like people talk about, they always love to say Thomas Jefferson was a deist. Well, yes, he was, but he was very deeply influenced by the Judeo-Christian tradition. Oh, the, the, the Declaration of Independence says all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, which as I said goes back to that Genesis statement that man is made in the image and likeness of God. Once you once you start to replace this, you know, we've we've we're kind of living now in a the the kind of afterglow, if you will, of Christianity, where we still have certain standards that are based in Christianity. But as the Judeo-Christian ethos becomes more and more distant, we're going to lose that. Yeah, and we're starting to lose it now. Well, I think it's talk important. A lot about you that. said it's important to understand the emotions. In the '70s, when I was growing up, I was agnostic, and I was very anti-church and anti-religion, and I didn't like religious people, and I didn't want a prayer said during my football game. I didn't want to be exposed to it. I thought I was going to somehow be polluted by it and somehow harmed by it. It's interesting. I don't view the world that way now. I view the world like you want to have your religion. You want to be. You want to be a believer. Great. I, I'm a big boy. I can get over it. If you dare say the word God in front of me, I'm going to be okay. Right. right. I won't crumble at this. Right. But it seems that so many people are very fragile, and they go, "Oh, because you believe this is somehow." They want freedom from religion, not freedom of religion, which was the right. founding notion. It's interesting. Obama changed the wording from freedom of religion to freedom of worship. And Obama talked about freedom of worship. And so what he is saying is what goes on behind the closed doors of your church on Sunday, the government shouldn't have any say on. But once you walk out that church door, stop it. Because... <laughs> Because it's an it's an it's an infringement on my rights, and it's an right. imposition. You're imposing your will, thoughts, whatever, on me. I feel right. great. If you want to do that, then you can't talk about a single value, right? You can't talk about uh, espousing gender this or gender that, or you know, tolerance for this or whatever, because those are your belief systems. You, whatever are inside your doors of your church or your home would be fine under that doctrine. You can't talk about any value system. Right. Because, you know, I think I think it's highly schizophrenic. As a Catholic, I see the world through Catholic eyes. So when I go and cast a vote for a candidate, I can't not be a Catholic when I walk into that voting booth. I can't not be a Catholic when I stand up and say what I believe. I, I you know, I can't. I can't divide myself into all of these different parts here. So, yeah. And so this idea of freedom of worship basically is schizophrenic. We're going to take that part of you and that part of you stays back here. But, and it's you know, not going to affect your thinking, your uh, approach, your values, your opinions. Mm -hmm. No, of course it is. Of course, of course it, it will. No, so, so basically I can be pro-life for any reason except because of religion like no that's part of that's part of the whole the whole thing and so you know i'm i live in new york here where 9 11 ground zero and i know if you remember the very famous uh the cross that that uh survived the the two pieces of metal 
there was a big push to get that removed from the 9-11 memorial museum because people the ground zero museum people said it was giving atheists headaches they couldn't bear to look upon this i gotta tell you i was a guy that used to get headaches i got over it this has been a great conversation but i've got to grab lunch um any okay. final points you want to make john no i think one of the, as we've been saying one of the important things is we're all religious be honest about what you worship. If you say, yeah, if you say, yeah, I worship money. Okay, uh, at least you're honest about it, and and I can deal with you. I can I can deal with that. But uh, you know, don't don't mask this and pretend it's not. And as we begin to see, we begin to see how it shows up so idolatrously in our society. And I think. As, as we said, you know, one of the reasons is because we're successful, because we're not in, we don't feel danger. You know? If we were living in China right now, where they take the Christians and they they haul them off to uh, to re-education camps. camps, volleyball yeah. camp. Yeah, I might, you know, um, this might mean this might mean more to me. You know, uh, it 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 might be some. It, It'd be something I think would be very, if I were going to live that life, like it'd be something important to me. And in the end, the important thing is this is, as St. Augustine said from the Psalms, you've made us for you, O God, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. As been described as we all have a God-shaped hole in our hearts. And what do we do? We try and put other things in to plug that hole and they don't work. So if only I had a Rolls Royce, I'd be happy. And then the second Rolls Royce, and then the third. And if only I had this, I'd be happy. And we're going to run around and we're going to chase it forever. Yeah. And it's not. It's not going to be. I always use the example I took. Imel, you remember Melda Marcos? No. Oh yeah, the shoes. She was. She was the first lady. Her oh yeah, Filipino. Right. When the when the uh, when he when he fell from power and they went into the presidential palace, they discovered she had about three thousand pairs of shoes. You know, if she wore if she wore ten pairs of shoes a day, nine pairs of shoes a day, it would still take her about a year to wear all of those shoes. Uh, what what is this? And the answer is because I got rid of God and I put something else in, and it's never going to be enough. This is something you see with celebrity culture where um, everyone wants to be a celebrity. And as an F tier celebrity, what I can say is that people don't get it. Like you can have the infinite money, you can have the fame, you can have the sex. And then after that, you see these celebrities crash and burn. And it's pretty repetitive because I, I watch this stuff in my free time. Uh, and then you see the other side of it is a lot of celebrities become Christian. You said with Kanye, Mark Wahlberg, Justin Bieber, because once you've had all that worldly success and you realize that it doesn't plug the hole, you wonder what's next. And I think because I'm part of the content creator world, this is something that I wish people had told like the like you're you're an 18 year old you become you have 5 million followers on youtube move to los angeles no one in society tells you that that trajectory is going to happen and it's and i think that's writ large across the entire society because we are a culture of celebrities who are hitting rock bottom mm -hmm. so there's a great study that was done on nuns and their sort of you know stoic lifestyle uh, they wake up in the morning, they meditate, they work hard, they eat a simple life, they have almost no possessions, and they meditate and they think about God all day long. And they're incredibly happy. When you ask them how satisfied and happy are they, they're very, very happy. People who aspire to be and or are Kardashians seem to be very, very unhappy, right? Because if happiness is unmet expectations, if your expectations are ridiculous, you're going to be ridiculously unhappy. And to bring it full circle, that's the younger son in the prodigal son story. Mm -hmm. Well said. Well, Absolutely. it was a pleasure having Fascinating discussion. Thank you very much. And my pleasure. It's going to be a good episode.